something you are very, very familiar with. Stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and repining till he appeared. The soul fell his word. A thrill of hope the weary world rejoiced. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, oh, hear the angel's voice. Oh, night divine, oh, night when Christ shall come. Told us this little story. I may not tell it exactly the way it was told, but it was something like this. 
A minister went to deliver God's word and discovered that in this congregation there was only one person that day. So not sure how the person was going to respond, he said to himself, let me go and find out from my parishioner or the, my congregant what the mindset is. So he whispered, should we have a service today? This man happened to be a farmer and said, Pastor, when I go to my barn and I only find one animal, I feed it. So the pastor said, all right, then let's have the service. So they had the service. It lasted one and a half hours. At the end of the service, we went to find out what happened. And how was the service? The man said, Pastor, I said, I feed my animal, but I don't give him the whole load. <laughs> I don't know what you're expecting tonight. The whole load? You might stay the whole night. Let's try and make it as brief as possible, but as meaningful as it ever can be. Do you not realize, dear friends, that God is a gracious giver? A little boy is sent by his father to collect some fruit in a field. And when he comes back with bountiful fruit, the father says to him, well done, son. Now dip your hand in there and get as much as your hand can take out. Then he said, no, daddy. I would rather you dipped your hand in there and took out some fruit for me. The boy realized his little hand would take out much less than his father's big hand would. And so he said, daddy, do it. <laughs> I pray that in the course of this evening, we will have the wisdom of that little boy. We have our mindset about what Christmas is and how we may celebrate it. We can either go that way or celebrate it the divine way. Our mind is not God's mind. God's mind is better and higher than ours. The choice is ours. What we think or what God gives us. According to the text that we have read, zeroing down to the seventh verse, a number of thoughts may be drawn out, but let me just draw your attention to two. That the text is telling us that life is sourced from God. For it tells us that he will bring about, he will establish, well, all of us, like David, who is mentioned in our text, have a time when we were born. We have a time when God would have actually either broken us as we were growing or built us up. But we can say he has built us up because we're no longer infants. We have reached the age at which we are now and are able to intelligently listen. But we know, whether or not we like it, a time will break down, we will come, for our bodies will get tired of living. Even when we want to live, they will say, no, you must go, and so we will die. So there must be a point of bringing up. So our God does allow birth. He does allow a build-up. He does allow a break. But that break can only be meaningful if there is a bringing up and only God is capable of doing that. But the truth is, not all of us appreciate the very fact that our existence is all owed to God. Well, the plain fact is, none of us can be if God was not. As one observer who is not even a religious person or even a Christian says, in fact a group of them, in God we live and move and have our being. I don't know if you identify that. What we discussed tonight is going to be particularly meaningless to you if you don't go that way. Well, as our dear friend Krista wonderfully pictured our Advent message this time, a hope and peace and joy and faith a life without hope is meaningless 
a life that is with a business is troublesome, troubled and painful, and almost unfit to be lived, and without joy. Who wants misery anyway? And if you don't have faith, you will die. Because you know you have faith in yourself that you move from this point to that point, that you can sit on that chair and do this, that you can do that and that. All of us are on the principle of faith. But the best of faith that we can exercise is the faith that we plant in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we'll add this aspect. God tells us he loves us. And here's his demonstration of love. At this particular time we remember how God tells us he loves us in that while we've gone our own way, he has intervened and said, my creation has rebelled against me. My creation has been given along, they've broken it. My creation has been given prophets, but they've disobeyed them. I go myself to address these stubborn people and demonstrate to them, I truly love them. And so Jesus comes, God shows his own love for us in that while we get bad to us, Christ has come and he has come to do you and me a lot of good. Will we look up to this Christ today or will we continue our way? The everlasting way, the way of real life, is the way of the Christ child being born. And it comes that way so that he might experience every bit of life that we have experienced, but only emerge with this difference that he did not do wrong. No complaint, no mistake, no failure, nothing. We know our lives are riddled with so many weaknesses, but not so with them. Here's the story. God is saying, I formed you. And God is saying, I who formed you will be fair to you. You have done me wrong. I could actually punish you. But instead, I will punish myself. I will send my son to live the life on your behalf. And when he made this perfect, I will pin him on the cross. And when he dies there, I will take his punishment as yours. So that when you believe that he's been punished for you, you will be set free forever. And so he forms. And so he fairly deals with his people. And he fairly deals with them that they might become fine. Good, beautiful, wonderful. But none of us is like that in ourselves. We are full of failure. We are full of mistakes. We are full of disappointment. But it's going to take all that away. And notice how it ends with it. That the God who actually deals that kindly with us may bring us to the place where we are free. What sort of freedom? Free from pain, free from worry, free from desperation, free from agony, free from suffering, free from fear of death, free from fear of eternity. Free! Because we come to this God who says, before you were formed, I knew you. And when you were formed, I saw your formless substance form you, and I began to shape you in your mother's womb. And when you came out, I was there. And as you are growing up, I was there, and I present you that today you might hear that I love you. Will you turn your eye to the Son of God, or will you give him your back? God not only sources life, he also sustains life. For we are told, this kingdom, this government, will last forever. It will go on life without end. So God seeks to establish a relationship with these people that is permanent. I will love you with everlasting love. I will get you engaged to me with a view to marry you. He tells us the totality of his creation. And this is what is going to happen. It will be forever. But notice, not only is it just forever, it's increasingly getting better, for it's perpetual. The perpetuation that says, it was good yesterday, it is better today, it will still be better the next day. So it's a growing improvement all the time. As somebody interprets the text in Revelation that says, 
the tree of life that will be given to the believers in God who get to heaven is meant for the healing of the nations. There will be no sickness there, there will be no pain. What does that mean? It will be for continuously getting better. So, permanent, perpetual, and here is something else. It is perfect. You know, because it's, it's in uprightness, it's in justice, it's in righteousness. Who, who doesn't want that? What causes imperfection are mistakes. What causes imperfection and sadness are failures. What causes imperfection and sorrow are omissions or exaggerations or failures or forgetting or doing something that's just a, mis a wrong. And who of us is free from that? And we know, oh, well, uh, uh, I forgot to do it. Oh, somebody, I didn't want you to forget. You know how we feel about that? So much goes on that is erroneous in our lives that life can be rich and fulfilling at this time, but our Christ is telling us, what is the worst disappointment you are going through? What is the biggest hurdle that is breaking your heart? What is that source of anguish upon your soul? I've come to deal with that. He who perfects all things does it so that he may bring us to a place where it's always, always pleasant. Who doesn't want pleasantness? For he says, of peace. Peace. There is peace only where there is no disturbance. There is peace where there is no loss. There is peace where there is no suffering. But where can you find the people who are trouble free? Nowhere. But here is a Savior that is telling us, I am coming down so that if you have a problem with wrongdoing, I may take over and teach you to do right. If you are always anxious and worried about this thing, I've come to take away your anxiety. If you have weights that are placed upon you very heavily and you can't endure them, I've come to bear your burden. Well, whatever is your hurdle, I've come to take that away from you. That's the text, what the text is basically saying. You know, those who commit suicide are actually saying it would be better off away from this troubled world because they've not met a savior who brings pleasantness to life. What Jesus is saying is that I want to bring you to life and that you may find that life is good, life is sweet. It, it is pleasant, promising, and progressively getting better. Who can give that? Only God's son can. You see, what you don't want to hear when you go to see a doctor is that he says to you, I am sorry. There's nothing I can do about this situation. Some of us have relations who are in palliative care. Because what the doctors have said is we can do nothing about this. All we can do is help the person die with as little pain as possible. So doctors can come to a point where they say, this illness has defeated us. And we all human beings come to that point. But it is at that point where this Savior tells us, I come so that if you have an end of life, I may tell you, your end is a beginning for me. So when we come to sin, he takes away. When we come to suffering, he can either take it away or help us put up with it. When we come to difficulties, he has a solution. Or he has a way of allowing us to sail above that difficulty instead of underneath and being crushed by it. When we come to the point of death, he points us over to the other side because he has the power of life and has demonstrated by living and dying and rising. And now promising those who believe him, you will live with me forever. Which way will you go? Your way or his way? Here is good Christmas. His way. You know, I said to myself, so many cards and gifts have been lavished upon me. Now, where will I get 150 cards to give to my parishioners and the others just to respond to their goodness? And I said to myself, I have a better gift, good news 
of a great joy, wrapped in swaddling clothes 2,000 years ago, but now brought to you in the form of a savior called Jesus. Ask yourself, if Santa were to come to me and say, what should I give you tonight? A car, a house, a friend, family. <laughs> what should I give you? Think about what's playing on your mind. Those are nothing compared to what the Christ is able to give you. Life and life everlasting. Do you want the worldly Santa or the God Santa? The choice is yours tonight. Uh, the preacher I told you about spoke for one and a half hours. I've taken two hours. <coughs> so let's stop there. I can see you are getting tired. 